Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. I sat down with David Larkins, who is the line editor for Pendragon, and we talked about playing the night you want to play in Pendragon. One of the great beauties of tabletop role-playing games is that they are open to the imagination and you can create any kind of character you want. David talks in this interview about how the new edition of Pendragon is going to support a wide range of characters that you can choose when you dive into the adventure. I'll jump across to the interview in just a moment, but first, please remember to subscribe to the Chaosium YouTube channel, and thanks for watching. The reason uh, it's important to say, like, everyone can be a knight, and what we mean by that when we say that, is there's a perception, I think, that only a certain type of person equals knight. You get a mental image in your head of like, what is a knight? And it's usually like a white male, sometimes British, French, whatever, European, white European male. When we're talking about history, that's the overwhelming image, obviously. But even in medieval times, we had exceptions historically, and also in the literature. And that's persisted to this day through various media. First, of course, obviously with books and then later on movies and uh, television and comics and you name it. The thing about the Arthurian myth cycle is that it always fits what the current culture and society want it to say. Uh, so, you know, early on with medieval romances, these were stories that were being told for nobles, about nobles. It presented an idealized uh, image of aristocratic life for knights and ladies alike. And uh, oftentimes, in fact, there were uh, caricatures of, of contemporary political figures that were woven into the stories, you know, that people at the time would recognize, you know, we don't recognize them now. As those stories have evolved over time, we've introduced other elements. And one thing I really wanted to do with the new edition is highlight the fact that ever since the game was, was published, first edition, in the 80s, it has always said, you can be whatever kind of knight you want to be. There was a section in the first edition rules that said, if you want to be a lady knight, you can be a lady knight. Um, it's a, it was a short section, admittedly. <laughs> you know, it was maybe a little easy to miss. And that's been the main thing, is that I think those, um, those parts of the book have not been as obvious, both in the text and in the art. And, you know, when Greg was working on the new edition, he had a, a whole network of folks who know about medieval history, they know about medieval literature, they know about Arthurian literature. He was always consulting with, with people, trying to learn more so that he could bring that into the game. With sixth edition in particular, he was presented with a lot of evidence, really. Um, things like um, fighting manuals from the 15th century that depict uh, women fighting, um, medieval romances from the time, you know, 14th, 15th century romances that are about women knights or ladies who take up the sword to defend, uh, you know, their family or their honor or what have you. Um, and then of course, post-medieval, you know, you have, uh, uh, various examples like Brutamart and the Fairy Queen. Um, Orlando Furioso has uh, women knights, uh, you know, and, and it just kind of rolls on from there. But, you know, Greg was particularly interested in hearing like, are there any medieval sources? And the answer to that is yes. Long story short, <laughs> and I'm talking mostly about women knights here, but, uh, you know, also going back quite a ways in the development of the, of the system. We've had, you know, you can be knights from other parts of the world too. So if you want, you know what, we can talk more about that. I don't wanna go on too much at length here, but um, that's, that's sort of the uh, under the hood answer of, of why we thought it was important to really emphasize, you know, this, this fact that everybody can be a knight. We can go into some of those other details shortly, but let me ask to start with, 
how does the upcoming edition of Pendragon support you building the knight that you want to be? First of all, there's, well, in the starter set, for example, there's eight uh, pre-generated characters. Three of those pre-generated characters are women knights. One of them is, uh, another one of the pre-generated characters is uh, from um, what we would now call Syria, sort of the Middle East, if you will. One of the women knights is, is from the Saxon culture, which is kind of the, the antagonistic culture at the time, but she's from a particular um, group of Saxons who have allied themselves with Arthur. Another of the, the women knights, actually, she's, we, we've kind of used mis- medieval historiography, which sort of said like, oh, well, the, the Romans brought these um, Amazons over as mercenaries from uh, not Central Asia, but, you know, sort of Iranian, uh, you know, background, uh, the Alans, basically, uh, who, you know, historically were brought over into Brittany um, in the late Roman Empire times. And, you know, we have separately, we have archaeological evidence that there were women warriors among those, you know, sort of horse nomads. So, you know, we just kind of thought, hey, that's a fun opportunity to sort of create some backstory in the game. Like, why are there women knights? You know, like, where are they? Where do they come from? And that sort of thing. So, we're facilitating it through the backstory. We're facilitating it through pre-generated characters. The core rule book gives you, it's, it's in the same tradition as previous editions where the core rule book assumes your knights are coming from the King of Salisbury. But uh, the way we've set up the backstory is that there was a uh, woman knight who was, you know, sort of marshal of the, of the county um, up to, you know, like through the, the period up to when the core book starts and so that kind of created a a tradition of of women knights in the county and you know mechanically it's very simple it's just like hey if you are a woman who wanted a martial career you would have been training to the exact same extent as the men so there aren't any like mechanical differences you know it's like if you want to be a woman knight be a woman knight you're called dame instead of sir that's it we have sections in the rule book that talk about how do you want to treat this in your game we have a certain default assumption, which is about 5% of knights are women. If you want it 50-50, make it 50-50. And then we'll be uh, releasing an advanced character creation book, um, working title is Knights and Ladies Adventurous. And that's just going to update to 6th edition what we have in 5th edition already, which is just a whole plethora of different sort of cultural backgrounds and you know different kinds of knights and, you know, all those options for people who really want to, you know, sort of mix it up. The starter set is, is actually, with those pre-generated characters, is in and of itself sort of a preview of that sort of more diverse range of, of available backgrounds. I love what you said about the Arthurian myth cycle telling the stories that the people who are telling it wanted to tell. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit about that and bridge it and talk about how it relates to how important it is for you to be able to play the knight that you want to play? The Arthurian cycle has been ongoing for 1,000, 1,500 years, depending on where you want it, you know, to sort of say that it started. Uh, nothing is going to stay around that long unless it is able to adapt through the ages to what people need it to be. So like I said earlier, it's like, okay, initially it started out as stories for a bunch of knights and ladies to listen to and think how cool they were. Uh, but, you know, as it sort of disseminated out into more popular consciousness, for example, Arthur becomes this figure of justice and equality over time that, you know, obviously is much more appealing to a wider audience, right? What I like to say is sometimes people have this immediate response like, oh, well, you you all play knights in this game? What are you all a bunch of paladins? Like that's boring, you know? And, and it's like, no, actually the, the game is explicitly not about that. In, in fact, it's the part of the fun of the game is discovering what kind of knight you are and what kind of knight your companions are gonna be that happens organically through the game based on dice rolls and role playing and all that stuff. And every single knight is, is a unique individual anyway. So even if you're all playing male knights from Britain, from Salisbury, you know, you're all going to be like totally different anyway. <laughs> um, so a lot of it is, is really just, um, what do you want to see in your game? 
for a, a very long time, my gaming group was primarily women. And it was always interesting for me to see, because they love Pendragon, right? But for a few of them, it was a little bit of a hard sell because, you know, it's like, oh, do we all have to play dudes? And yeah, I said, no, not at all, you know. But then what was interesting is some of them were like, well, maybe I want to play a dude. I'll play a dude, you know. And then other ones were like, no, I'd like to play a lady knight. That's cool. So it's like just you're not hurting anybody by, you know, offering these extra options. And in fact, I mean, you know, the times we live in today are increasingly recognizing the diversity of our global community, right? So even though I do believe that it is important for the Arthurian myth cycle to stay rooted in its time and place where it came from, at the same time, you can show how much it's changed just over time. I mean, this is nothing new even um, you know, in a modern context, since, you know, you can go back to the to the 70s when you start having these sort of reimaginings of, you know, Arthur and, and his stories told from different perspectives. Well, we're going to tell it from Merlin's perspective. We're going to tell it from Guinevere's perspective. It's it's a little postmodern, if you will. Um, but yeah, like I said earlier, it's, it's like you can really just adjust the dial depending on what your group is looking for. But it's always better to offer more options than not enough. We've talked a little bit about the diversity of background and identity, but I'd like to talk a little bit about diversity of values. Can you talk about how, you know, when you are the knight that you want to be, what that means in terms of how you might approach the world and how the stories that we tell using the Arthurian myth cycle now might have changed to better cater to what we feel is important and what we feel is knightly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, that's again, kind of getting to the heart of the game or, or your, your personal value system and how that manifests. And there's really no wrong answer because glory is glory. Like when you're accruing glory, it's, it's a, it's a neutral uh, value, right? So you can be a dastardly knight and you can still get glory for doing things that get you glory, right? Uh, honor is the other axis, and that's something that will fluctuate up and down. So in the game, we have examples of what will get you honor and what will cost you honor. And it's the, you know, it's the things you would expect, you know, like obviously not honoring your oath or violating hospitality or committing flagrant uh, crimes, essentially, you know, fratricide or what have you, are going to uh, cost you honor to varying degrees. People can set out to ruin your honor. We have a really neat system in the new edition for like, if, you know, people are conducting a whisper campaign against you to like undermine your reputation, you know. Um, but the other the other variable there is is religion. You know, Pendragon does acknowledge the the presence of religious belief within the Arthurian stories, and it's an important part. The game has Christians, it has pagans, it has other types of pagans, so it has like British pagans, it has like Norse pagans, you know. Um, and again, like those are different value systems, but there's there's no like inherent judgment on like what's better or worse. Uh, you know, and, and those are in there specifically, again, to give people some choice. If you want to do a, a game that's more in, in step with like the older medieval romances where everyone's a Christian, hey, go for it. You know, you can do that. A lot of players like to opt for the British pagan uh, option these days. And that's perfectly fine, too. In fact, one thing we're working on with the revised Great Pendragon campaign uh, we're going to have, you know, obviously the Grail quest and all that, and we're we're expanding that out as much as we as much as word count will allow, and that that also includes an option for pagan knights going on the Grail quest because it's sort of the the metaphysical uh, side of like the Grail on the one hand and the cauldron on the other, right? And so these are. These are sort of two sides of the same metaphysical concept. So it's the grail quest if you're Christian and it's the cauldron quest if you are pagan. I think that it's 
great to be able to alter everything to suit what your group needs. I think that's one of the beauties of role playing. It's one of the most important things. But I also love how much effort is clearly being put into looking at historical records and trying to bring out the medieval aspect of all of this. Can you talk in terms of diversity of background and the different parts of the world where knights would commonly emerge from that might have found themselves in the Arthurian court? Sure, yeah. Um, so the, the default, like I said, is, is the, the native British population, the Cumric population. Um, so this is like pre-Saxon Britons. And um, that's the assumed default, okay. However, this is both in the game and in the literature. As Arthur uh, becomes more prominent, he becomes this magnet that, that brings people in. First of all, it spreads the concept of knighthood throughout the, the world. And then, he, and then these new knights come to Camelot to kind of see what all the hype's about, basically. So um, that's, that's one of the fun things, actually, as the campaign goes on, is, is you can, everyone can start as knights from Salisbury, but, you know, people die. That's part of the game. We've talked about this before, multi-generational <laughs> gaming. Um, but, uh, you know, as that happens, you can bring in new knights from other lands. And those can even just be lands adjacent to the kingdom of Logris, which is kind of southeastern modern England. Uh, you know, so you can have knights from Cambria, knights from beyond the wall, knights from Ireland, from the continent, et cetera. And then it can just sort of expand out from there. We, we actually put a fair amount of work into, uh, as we're preparing the Knights and Ladies Adventurous book, into just going back and taking a look at the different cultures. How do they work? You know, how are they grouped uh, and so forth? We're, we're handling cultural um, attribute and skill bonuses a little differently, not radically different, but it's, it's, it's a little different from fifth edition. So it was an opportunity to sort of go back and see how is this working, right? And one of the fun things we've been doing actually is, is sort of integrating medieval, um, uh, you know, ethnography or anthropology, however you want to phrase it, because, you know, they had some wild ideas about where people came from. And that's already in the game because, you know, we already have the medieval belief that the Britons got their name from Brutus, who was a Trojan who came to the island of Alba and conquered it from the giants, you know. Um, so it's, that's the reality of this world. You know, I always like to remind people, Pendragon is not a historical role-playing game. <laughs> it has historical trappings, of course, but it is, it is set in, a, in, the, in the mind of a medieval storyteller. So this is why people in sub-Roman 5th fifth, fifth and 6th century Britain wear chainmail or plate armor or whatever, and there are castles and tournaments with jousting and all that stuff, right? Because that's what they knew in 1300. Uh, so cultures are a similar thing where we um, have sort of, you know, gone back and re-examined how we're setting up uh, the different cultures and we're grouping them, you know, like in, in sort of different ways. The German sort of umbrella culture, but that includes Saxons, Danes, Franks, Goths, you know, so you can be a knight from France, you can be a, you know, you'd be a Frank, you can be a knight from Spain, you'd actually be a goth, you know, you'd be a Visigoth, or you can be a Spanish knight who uh, has the uh, Roman cultural heritage, right? So that's another cultural group of the Romans, which includes like the Greeks, like our Syrian friend from the starter set, uh, you know, the Aquitanians from um, southwestern France, modern southwest France, uh, you know, and then you have like uh, even further afield, you have the Huns, and you have the Zazamanx, which was sort of the medieval term for uh, pre-Islamic Northern African. But we're having fun with it. You know, like I, I recently read about uh, particular um, origin stories for the Scots that are, it's very similar to the, the Britain origin story where they come from like, you know, sort of Eastern Mediterranean uh, heroic uh, background and they travel to uh, modern day Scotland and um, one thing for, for players who are familiar with older editions, actually just incidentally, I'm just going to throw this in because we're talking culture, is we're actually reimagining Picts uh, because the version of Picts that we had had in previous editions basically came straight out of Robert E. Howard and like, you know, 30s pulp 
fantasy like Conan or Bran McMoran and those sorts of stories. So we, we went back and we looked at like, well, what do the medieval people think the picks were? And it was actually, it was imagined that they uh, had more in common with the Scythians. Uh, so they are, you know, like kind of a, a central Asiatic people who came to Britain, you know, like long, long ago and settled there. So they, they're not as pulp fantasy as they have been in, the, in past editions. Is there any mention in Pendragon or support for playing knights that are well outside of the scope of the medieval British world? So if you want to play a knight, for example, from Eastern Asia or something like that. Uh, you know, nothing in, the, nothing in the core book or the immediate expansions. Uh, however, there was some draft material that Greg was working on that is very interesting. I think he called it Journey to the East and or something something along those lines and it's kind of a marco polo sort of situation so i've got that in my back pocket you know <laughs> just in case you, you know we're also working on uh, you know there's paladin which came out already is you know a, a spin-off from pendragon right it uses the pendragon mechanics to tell a different story which in this case is charlemagne and his paladins but we also have other uh, games, standalone games that use the Pendragon engine, uh, one of which is set in medieval Japan, for example. Uh, we have one set in heroic Greece, and we have plans for other ones as well. So, and, and these are like completely compatible systems, right? So that would be another way to integrate different types of knights. You would just see the examples of like, oh, how do they handle, you know, uh, samurai armor and samurai martial training if I really wanted, you know, kind of like an early um Japanese warrior to show up at King Arthur's court or something you know uh that would be pretty cool actually is there anything I've forgotten is there anything that you want to add any questions I didn't ask you that you'd like to elaborate on I really think one of the most important things about playing Pendragon is understanding that it is not about uh creating limitations it's about opening up opportunities um you know Pendragon is, the reason people who play it love it so much is that um, through such a seemingly simple setup, it unlocks so much in terms of storytelling and and just sort of personal journeys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't want to get like too too wrapped up in this, but it it really does like kind of um, give you an opportunity to view the world from a different perspective, whether you're you know a, a Zazamank or or even just a medieval Christian knight you know, because none of us are medieval Christians and none of us are knights. So that right there is going to create a different worldview for you. And you're already wearing somebody else's skin, essentially. So why not just make it as, as diverse as possible to give you as many options as possible, is my philosophy.